thank you for joining in for the Mountaineer Farm Talk. We have a great guest today. Uh, Jake Osborne is with us from Merck. He has been around the industry for a little while. He's been a little ag teacher. He worked for uh, Bear Ring. Bear, say that name. It always tongue ties me. Bearinger or Bowringer, however anybody wants to say. Bearinger, okay. But he worked for them for ten years, and now he's with Merck. And um, but he he brings a lot of knowledge to the table, and we are glad to have him with with us. We also have uh, Evan Wilson with yep, us. Evan here, Cowell County. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about fly control today. Uh, glad to have you with us, Jake. Oh, glad to be here. Glad to be here. Especially oh. fly control is kind of timely right now. Oh yeah, I, is that do uh, you see a lot of uh, products being moved and people trying to get ahead or keep up right now with the flies, right? Yeah, uh, you know, weather in certain parts of the world uh, kind of changes quicker than others, but yeah, flies can be a problem starting about April all the way through the summer. But definitely right now is when we start getting calls about the the results of fly control. So. What uh, what flies are we, you know, that you see, are we battling right now? Now, right now, the mostly what guys are seeing are horn flies or face flies. But uh, here before too long, we'll start seeing a lot of stable flies, deer flies, and around us, horse flies can be a big problem. Those grand champion inch-long horse flies that like to come out and land on you. Those those will start showing up here in about two to three weeks, and they'll stay around for about anywhere from four to six weeks. Okay. But horn flies are probably the one that we'll talk the most about today. Uh, those are the ones we can control, and those are usually the ones that uh, present the biggest problem for cattle producers. So what uh, what problems economically do you see with these insect uh, and where insects and where do you see kind of the threshold? on treating these i mean you know are, are you going out i know we've we've done a lot of research and we we kind of know okay well if you have this many flies for this you know uh section of animal you know probably need to treat but where where do you see that that fits in with production in you know a, a regular farming situation a lot of the companies put out different information on this and and in general they say that flies are to the cattle industry uh, will cause $4.19 billion in economic loss per year. But horn flies in particular are the ones we can control, and those contribute about a fourth of that, about a billion dollars in economic loss to cattle producers. And the majority of that is in weight gain, uh, the gain that the cattle could have gained um, but don't. And what it does, truly, horse, horn flies do a couple things. They can transmit disease. And they can also basically change the habits of cattle. The cattle are more concerned about congregating in groups and not going out and grazing and, and gaining weight. And so it truly about 72% about of the losses are contributed in habit changes to the cattle. And the other 28% are actually from the blood meal that the flies take. So that, that's the weight loss that you see. Uh, as far as when to treat cattle or when to, to – uh, you know, be concerned about it. That's always a question that comes up. And there's a company answer, and then these, there's the answer that I give when I'm out visiting customers. The, the company answer to that question is, depending on who you talk to, it's somewhere between 100 and 200 flies per animal. Now, I, I don't know, John, if you're going to go out and count those on a, on a back of a cow or not. I know I'm not. <laughs> so I always tell producers, the sooner uh, you start, the better off you are. Because if you flies are a problem and your cattle aren't going out and grazing, you're usually already behind the eight ball. And so if you're just now starting fly control, where we were a little cooler this year, you might be okay. But anytime you're in the 80s to 90s and you're already starting to see flies, it's time to start treating. Okay. Yeah, and I, I tell everybody there's a textbook way to do it, and then there's a logical way to do it. And you got to kind of find that happy median in there because yeah, I'm not counting flies either. <laughs> I got a lot of cows and I don't think I've ever counted flies in my life in, in my production plan. Uh, Evan, you've been quiet. Uh, jump in there with a question. You mentioned there a second ago, what are some of the bigger diseases or problems you see besides some, what are the ones you see that may impact our farmers more or easier to treat or 
can cause severe problems down the road. Yep. Yep. Uh, so some of the calls that we get this time of year uh, that flies contribute to the most, the first one's pink eye. Um, and we're starting to see some other strains of pink eye that are starting up. But the normal uh, Maraxella bavoculi or, or bovis, they call it, is the normal strain. Bavoculi is kind of the new strain. And the bovis strain, um, we always tell farmers it's a management thing. Uh, and, and pink eye is truly something that you have to manage your way through throughout the entire year. And what you have to do is control those flies. To do that, you got to do a kind of a multi-purpose approach. And um, one of the things might be right now is pastures are kind of heading out and getting bigger. Usually they have to have a scratch on their eye or something to allow that pink eye to get in there and to allow a fly to land it and present it to the animal. And so if you're keeping those pastures clipped, uh, regularly, once a month or so this time of year, or even just twice a summer, if you if that's all you can get to it, that sure helps prevent the spread of pink eye. Uh, fly control in the mineral can be one. Ear tags can be another thing. Pour-ons, back rubbers, those are all things we can do to prevent the spread of pink eye and control those flies. Um, the other disease that a lot of farmers are, are facing right now would be anaplasmosis. And that's one thing that ticks and flies that take a blood meal can spread. And that's truly a problem in eastern Ohio and all the way down to your part of West Virginia now. Um, we're seeing more and more anaplasmosis. And so that's something else that fall. we need to control uh, flies. Yeah, in late summer and fall, you know, early fall, we usually see a, a outbreak, you know, right there in August, you know, uh, and, and that has really been a concern to the farmers in this region because, you know, there's something, it's usually very isolated pockets, but lately it's been getting bigger and bigger pockets. And uh, of course, you know, everything in the South is already infected. And if, if the animal gets infected at an early age, real young, they can produce enough blood cells to keep up uh, red blood cells. But, um, you know, if those animals are mature, three years old and older, then they can have detrimental uh, losses to those animals. And that is something that um, it really a lot of producers in this area are concerned about. Um, so fly control is one of those and are, you know, especially biting flies. Uh, but also keep in mind, you need to be changing out your needles. Anything that punctures into that animal, you know, that biting fly is puncturing into that animal. So also keep in mind with the instruments you're using, needles, uh, you know, implant guns, anything like that, uh, either change the needles out or sanitize between uses. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I wanted to, I would have forgot about that before. I wanted to put that in no, there. No, you're, that, you're exactly right. And, and it's hard once those horn flies get ahead of a producer to really get back control of them. Uh, those horn flies, as far as anaplasmosis, they say that they can take up to 40 blood meals a day. And so once they're to that point and really hitting those animals hard, it's just really hard to stay in front of something like anaplasmosis if you have a fly problem. So, so now's the time to start getting in front of it. What active ingredients are y'all using now in your products? You know, cause you know, different, you got pour ons, you got uh, fly tags, uh, you got back rubs, like we said, kind of, you know, what, what are some of the active ingredients you may see in some of those fly controls? A lot of the products that, that you would see uh, are uh, the older products, especially are permethrin based. Mm -hmm. And, and I always talk to producers about, uh, especially if you're dealing with crop farmers about rotating and you got to think about a guy who's put out soybeans for years and years and has used Roundup. Well, if he's used Roundup for years and years and years, all of a sudden you've got some weeds that are resistant to Roundup. You know, you have some mare's tail or ragweed or whatever like that. And you switch uh, what you're spraying with and use some Liberty and all of a sudden that, that can help, right? Take care of some of those resistant weeds. Well, flies get the same way. If you use permethrin um, for years and years and years without any sort of carrier in it, um, then all of a sudden you switch to something like uh, Lambda Cyathrin um, a newer product with a carrier agent in it, then all of a sudden flies are, are really good, right? Your control is awesome. And so an older product that has a carrier in it that's a good product maybe something like Ultra Boss, mm -hmm. but that's a Promethean-based product. 
And so the first question I'll ask a guy is, what have you used? And if they say, oh, we've used, you know, a generic Promethrin for years and years and years. If you switch from a product like Ultra Saber, um, they're going to be real happy with you for about two years. And, and flight control is just going to be awesome. But they need to know that in about two years, you have to have a plan down the road to switch away from that. And maybe switch back to your Promethrin based products and they're going to work really well. So, um, you know, an Ultra Saber product or something like that would be something I'd switch a guy to that's been on Promethrin forever. So. Well, uh, and two, kind of keep in mind, uh, that kind of works with the wormers as well. And, you know, a lot of people are switching back to from that pour on uh, wormer back to that oral drench white wormer because the effectiveness is just higher because it hasn't been used in years and years and everybody's been using the pour ons. So you may need to also add a insecticide with that because that doesn't give you external coverage, right? That white wormer. That's, that's correct. Yeah, if you're going to switch back to the white wormer, and that, that's a perfect point. A lot of guys use a, an old generic ivermectin pour on for everything, right? It, it might work really well for fly control for about two weeks, but that's all the all the fly control you're going to get with it. And then after that, flies are just eating them up again. And if guys have used that for a long time, even the fly control is not very good on it. But if you're switching to something like a Safeguard or a Valbazin product to deworm with, those are purge dewormers that work great. And it's good in a deworming rotation to use those, but you're not getting any external parasite control with them. And so you, you truly need to use something for um, the sucking lice and the flies and, uh, and lice control. So that's where your porons, uh, kind of need to be used, something like a uh, permethrin-based product or, or a Ultra Saber type product like those. The other thing I think it's important in those porons is that they have a carrier agent. Um, there's a product, there, there's a carrier in most of them called Piperinol Butoxide. And again, if you're a crop guy or thinking about those, if you put a surfactant in your sprayer, when you're spraying your pastures or spraying your crops, it basically makes it stick to them a little better. Well, think of that piperinol butoxide in those porons kind of like that. It makes the product last a lot longer on the animal. And so the really old promethean braced products don't have that, whereas some, uh, some of the newer promethean braced products do, and it truly makes the product last a lot longer on the animal. Okay. Brandy, you've been pretty quiet. Or are you, uh, she's at camp. Uh, uh, Evan's at camp as well. I, I really applaud these these two agents for getting on because they have kids running all around at 4-H camp right now. Uh, Brandy, do you have any questions? She she may be chasing the youngins. Right? Oh, she's hey back. Hey, no, no, I, I'm sorry, John David. I'm, oh, I've just been listening. Yeah, it's been a crazy morning out here. We've got beautiful weather and uh, just, just, just listening so far, I did think about, and maybe you've already addressed this and I apologize, it's Kind of my attention's not exactly focused today as it should be, but um, the fly tags and their and their uh, life, you know, the how long they last. Um, do the tags, like you say, you want to put them on early when you see the when you see the actual flies starting to bother the animals. Do they last throughout the entire summer season? I've all, often wondered if if it would pay the producer to actually change out the tag through, uh, through one summer season, or is that uh, the recommendation one, one set of ear tags per season? Brandy, that's a great question. That's something we run into all the time. Um, it all depends on what tag they're using and when they're working their cattle. If a guy's working cattle in February and just kind of working them one time and going ahead and putting a fly tag in, then the answer is absolutely not. But if you're waiting until May, and we always tell producers to think about Memorial Day uh, for deworming and for fly control, then that's a great time to go ahead and put those tags in and it should last until the end of the fly season. So you should get about 120 days as long as you're rotating every couple of years. Uh, the other key to fly control is when they get done with those tags in the fall, if you're going to preg check in the fall, cut those things out at the end of fly season. If you don't, it really promotes resistance 
and, and building up to those compounds that are in there. So, you know, it, some of the some of the fly tags that you might use, there's three or four different compounds in them. But if you can rotate uh, about every year or every other year on your fly tags, those are going to last a long time for you and do a great job. Now, See, I, I, I was wondering kind of about, about that, like um, in some philosophies, it's like where the one um, effective pesticide or, or where, where the one effective pesticide out first before you switch to another group so that that way you don't build resistance among all of them. So that's one philosophy, but here's you're breaking out there a little bit, Brandy. Every, every year or so, or, or do you recommend, like, if you got a strong one that you see that doing job to keep them until it's not so so I would say uh, one one year or two years to the most so if you're gonna if you're gonna use for instance uh, a saber extra tag as a lambda cyalthrid if you're gonna use that and ultra saber together you're using one drug or one compound for fly control that year so if you use that for two years you need to rotate so kind of kind of be conscious of what you're using and it would make sense to use the same thing via pour on and fly control for those couple years and that way you're not building up resistance another option is they have tags out now that have more than one compound in them um, we have one called a double barrel and it's a good tag um, and it has more than one thing in it uh pre pre methyl and lambda cyathrin and it's it's a great tool for fly control but again after about two years you need to rotate because then they'll build up resistance to both those if you don't so it's always a good option to rotate after a couple of years and uh, definitely change up your pour ons and your and your tag options so there are some uh there are some deworming options that will help control flies a little bit too for the first couple of years um, there's a product on the market now called Long Range, and it does a, a great job on fly control for the first year, and then fly control will tend to, to fall off. Uh, Sidectin injectable is another one. You're going to get a few weeks of fly control out of both of those, and they can do a good job there. So that can help. Again, it's kind of a multi-purpose approach. So there's some other things out there now, um, like a vet gun. If any of you have seen that, it basically has little paintballs filled with permectrin product um, or permethrin product. And so you can actually go out and shoot your cows with about three of those and get some fly control that way if it's not easy to get your cattle up and treat them. How effective is that thing? Because I've seen it at Royal King and Traction Spot for sale for a while, but I haven't really seen anybody use it. Uh, some of the some of the producers that I have that have them love them, but the options are somewhat limited on what you can use, right? So if we're talking about rotating product every couple of years, it's great for a couple of years, but then you need to move on to a different product. And so the options you have to shoot through it and treat your cows are kind of limited. Now, I would say that's going to change as that gun's out longer, right? They're going to come out with more things to use. Now, how now how um, how do you know if they're getting the full dose? Because you have some cows that, uh, you know, just run a little bit and they stop, you know, or some that just kind of go nuts uh, once you you hit them there. So, have you seen a like a range of different amounts of product that they get from those, um, situ you know, each situation there? Yeah, it's it, it can vary. Um... And that's the question with a product like that. You know, are you getting the correct dosage on the animal? And that, that's a little up in the air with that product. Um, one thing I'll tell you about most products in general, uh, they, you're better off to overdose and underdose as far as promoting resistance. And so 
if you're wondering whether you hit an animal with one of those or not, shoot an extra one versus not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, Same thing with any... dewormers or anything else as far as that goes. Now, a lot of my older farmers, they swear by sulfur blocks. Now, they use the porons, they use the air tags, but they also put a sulfur block in with their minerals. Uh, mm -hmm. And they say that that, I guess the sulfur probably gets on the face and the flies do not like the sulfur. That's how I assume it works. But they swear that that will um, help with pink eye and flies around the face. Have y'all seen any uh, data that come out on the, any of that uh, sulfur products? I, you know, there's some sulfur products out there along with uh, there's a product called Redmond's Salt that uses garlic. Okay. And uh, any of those products, if you're using in combination with others, uh, along with a different kind of mineral with maybe out of sedent or something like that, there's there's way more research on that than there would be on, on the sulfur based products. And so if you're talking about a feed through product, if you're wanting something to add, a sulfur block's cheap, but if you're if you're wanting something that's going to work for sure, why not look at a mineral with maybe out of sit or something that's definitely for fly control in it? Producers have way more luck with that. I was hoping you'd say that because you know I, I tell them you know if, if it works for you, keep doing it. But you, that's probably not a stronghold in, in fly control. But you know uh, you know when when you get a farmer set in his ways. That's what works and that's what he uses so uh, for him. But uh, but yeah, that uh, I've seen a lot of that and, and we, we've been working with producers to try to introduce them to new products and everything. I'd like to have you down one day maybe in a meeting in, or you know a producer meeting and maybe come and kind of kind of give this talk to you know in person. I think my farmers really love to have you. Uh, Evan, do you have any another question here? I, I do. You mentioned about the beginning of this this um, discussion about the, the back rubs. Do you have recommendations for that or where to put those or how often to change out the, the powder or the liquid in those? You know, um, back rubs are, are, I think, and the mineral feeders now, some of those will offer some, some, some of those have basically a fly dip as they enter into the mineral feeder. And I think those are a great way to help with flies because in a high traffic area or a gateway or something like that, where you know those animals are going to be going through to a water source, um, if they if you can get them to rub themselves once a day on that fly rub, that is one of the best ways to for fly prevention. Now, what tends to happen is producers let those run out and they don't get filled quite as often as they should, and so. Uh, again, a permethrin-based product, if that's the direction you're going for those year or two, that can be a really inexpensive way to get those cows treated and, and keep it on there. And so there are certain products like the Atraban product, you can basically put it in with either diesel fuel or uh, some sort of carrier like that and put it in your back rubber. And that'll mix with a quart of that product will mix with 50 gallons of water. Um, I've even got some dairies and some beef farms that will keep cattle in barns. They'll run a mister system with the old promethean based products through them. And so there's all kinds of options for daily fly control like that. Um, and, and those are some things we need to look at. Another thing we didn't talk about is premise spray. And I don't know if you guys have very many farmers that will spray around feed bunks or spray around hay feeders. But hay feeders in particular, um, where cattle are gonna congregate, that can be just a, the breeding pool for those flies, right? Where those larvae are gonna be. And so moving your hay feeders and scraping where you fed hay in the wintertime is a great way to kind of prevent flies before the beginning of the season starts. But there's some really good premise sprays out there um, one of them that we have is called Grenade, and I use it to spray all around the outside of the barn. It'll basically kill anything that flies, also spiders. So we even spray around the house with it. Um, and that's a great product to prevent flies and where they're going to lay those eggs. So hopefully you would prevent some, some flies that way as well. Great. Because We built a new barn this winter. We have a big gate across 
and the cows seem to enjoy it. Thought I'd get one of those big back rub socks things and stick back there, but I haven't been able to find one. I just wonder how effective those were. If not, I know a lot of our guys used to use diesel, just diesel fuel or old motor oil years ago, but they've kind of got yep. away from that here, here in the last several. That can still be a good carrier agent if you're mixing in a promethium product with it. And so okay. that back rub is a good idea. As long as you're willing to go out there once a week and, and kind of recharge it, so to speak. Right. Awesome. My, uh, some of my producers, they put them right there in front of the mineral feeder. So they, they when they go to uh, fill up the mineral feeder, they, they kind of reboot the back rubber too. Yep. And, and they sell some, Tartar makes a mineral feeder now that actually has um, a, a fly applicator or a based applicator right on top of it. Okay. Attached to it. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen that one here at our, um, Point Ag Supply, they've had it out there by their loading dock here recently. Yeah. So when, uh, you know, we talked about starting probably in May with some of the fly control products, is that the same with minerals or do we need to start the minerals a little bit earlier to get that in their system? You know, minerals should be fed year round, whether it's in the feed or not. Um, job David because yeah, I was thinking just the fly control of course you'll switch to a, you know from you know your uh, regular mineral to a fly control mineral uh, when you you know the fly season comes up yes I'm I definitely yeah definitely feed cattle minerals year round but I was just talking about specifically the fly control mineral when would you start that I would start that the tick earlier if you could get that in starting in April or, or somewhere like that um, because what tends to happen is maybe guys will feed a breeder booster mineral and they'll wait for the fly control part of things. And then once it gets hot, uh, the, the flack, the, all of a sudden flies are there and you're behind. And so mineral will be one of those things that change when grass starts hitting. And that will be right there around the beginning of April. If you could start your fly control, the mineral, then you'll stay ahead of them better. Okay. Now do they make a, a lot of my guys, by that time, like a high mag mineral. Do they make a high mag mineral with a fly control component? It depends on where you're buying your mineral. I've seen uh, Kentucky Nutrition in Kentucky has that option. And there's a few southern state stores that are carrying some cardio mineral now. And I believe they have an option for that as well. Um, now, it, it depends. If you're feeding Purina, Wind and Rain or something like that, they probably don't have that option but there are some companies that, that make their own mineral that will definitely make that for you. Good deal. Good deal. Well, uh, any other questions here? We're, we're kind of getting, getting a little bit closer to time, but uh, Evan looked like you had a question yeah. there. I, I do. Okay. When you're talking about the fly tags, are you using the same ones on your cows and calves or you do you buy a certain tag just for your calves and certain ones for your cows? A lot of guys are using the same one for the cows and calves, and that way it's the same compound. Where I see producers skimp maybe or, or try to cut some cost that actually hurts them is most of the fly control products are two tags per animal. And a lot of times you only see them put one tag in a cow. And Brandy mentioned earlier about season-long fly control. If you put one tag in, you're not going to achieve that. And so two tags per animal, if it calls for that, on the label, they need two tags per animal. So, and just because you're throwing it in a calf or something, um, don't necessarily mean you, you need to change what the label says on the fly tag. Okay. Yep. I, th I think you're right there on that. We have a lot of guys that want to put one, one tag in there and they call it a day. Yep. Yep. And, and I understand they're, they're wanting to all of a sudden make a, a $4 per head investment into a $2, right. And stretch that out. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if it's not going to control flies, you just wasted your time running through the chute and doing that. Yep. Now, you mentioned about horse flies earlier in, in the year there, and, and I know we all battle them in the summertime. Uh, those are the hardest to control for me uh, personally because, you know, they come and go. Uh, what is the best product uh, you've seen out there that does not have a knockdown for those horse flies? Honestly, John, David, the, those ones that we get around here, um, <laughs> a fan. <laughs> they just dust them off, keep on going, you know. You sprinkle a little seven yeah. dust on them, they just 
dust it off and keep it going, right? <laughs> they seem to drink that uh, permethrin product for lunch and don't seem to care if it's on the back of an animal. So there, there's probably not a great answer for that question other than they're going to be around for four to six weeks and go away because that's just the life cycle of them. Yeah. And so controlling them is not as easy, that's for sure. But I have seen Addison in the mineral work fairly well on the population of that fly. And so if you can, if you can, again, do a multi-purpose approach, it's going to help the population of those horse flies as well. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I got a kind of a question. It's a little off topic here from fly control. Now, some of these products that you have will also control lice there in more of the winter months. Uh, do you have a lot of interest in, in lice control in your, your side of Merck? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and lice is one of those, lice is one of those things that we get a lot of calls about and that, that needs to be something that is talked about earlier in the season. Cause again, it's just like fly control. If you start early, you can get ahead of it, but the lice season that's on the label for all these products is not what our lice season is in Ohio and West Virginia. Life season can be uh, basically think about it from November all the way to March. And there's not a product on the market that will last that long. And so when they talk about season long lice control, they're talking about around 90 days. And our life season truly in our area is longer than that. And so if you can start to tell producers to, to get on lice between Thanksgiving and Christmas for the first time, you can truly start to get ahead of it and break up the life cycle of when those louse will lay the eggs. The other thing is if they already have a problem, there's really not a product on the market that'll take care of it in a single dose. Because what you're doing the first time is killing the lice that's on the animal and killing what lay eggs it touches, right? But if they're going back into the same bedding or going back into the same barn, all those other eggs are gonna hatch back out. And so using a premise spray is part of it. The other part of it is treating the animal 14 days apart. And that's pretty important. So if you treat an animal for lice and you've already seen lice, you got to go back in 10 to 14 days later and treat them again, because that truly breaks up the life cycle of those louts. And I, I think you're right on spot there, because most people around here, they wait till they start seeing ball spots and everything else. And, and you, February, you know, gets here and your cows look pretty rough and they're wanting to treat then and they just want to do a one treatment of ultra balls or something like that and they call it good, but that's really not taking care of the job, is it? No, and if you're going to wait until then to do it after you've already seen those problems, you truly have to treat them twice, 14 days apart. That'll take care of it, um, but but you got to do it twice. That's right. That's right. And and I, I like that you touched on the eggs hatching out. You know, it's kind of like that either seed bank for weeds or even that worms. When you worm a cow, you never want to, you know, send her to a fresh pasture right then because she's shedding those eggs. So there's exactly. always that next generation ready to go go behind the one you kill. Yeah. And, and lice is another thing where you truly need to rotate products. You know, you, you need to rotate. If, if you've used a uh, permethrin-based product for years, switch to uh, the Ultra Saber and, and just kind of rotate around. Okay. Okay. Evan, you got anything else? I, I can't think of much right now. I, I well, there, was, there was a – okay, I know a lot of guys, they don't like to put the two fly tags in because they don't like all the holes in the cow's ear, the number tag in the other. There was a product out, oh, probably five, six, seven years ago now, they could slip over your tax. Is that a product going to be back out in the market, or do you know what I'm talking about? No, I, I guess I don't. I haven't seen anything like that in my travels okay, here lately. Really. I think it was from Y-Tech there a few years ago. We talked to a guy out in Columbus, the Baja Beef Expo, and he said, well, they were they were causing um, chemical burns because they were putting them on non-Y-Tech tags, and those, I guess, permethrin or something that was causing some burns. That one, sure. you uh that was probably a different comp there are a few compounds and, and that's one thing i guess we didn't touch on that we should um there are a few of those newer compounds that that are kind of harsh i mean you don't want to get them in the eyes of the animal you when you're pouring you make sure you pour from the neck all the way back to the tail but you stay off the head 
because if those get in the eyes of the animals, they're going to burn them and, and make them wish they were having a different day. And truly, I know it sounds crazy, but these producers need to wear gloves when they're applying these newer fly tags, because if you get that on your skin, it's going to cause a little bit of a burn. But you need to wear some rubber gloves when you're putting those fly tags in. Never thought about that. Yeah, I, you know, I, as I get older, I, I get, I try to get a little smarter as I get older. You know, you think you will anyway. But uh, I've started using more protection. And I've noticed it even with vaccinations. Used to when I give vaccinations, I would ache for two days after I done pour on and vaccinations. And now that I wear gloves, I don't have any problems. So that does make a difference. I mean, it's made to soak into the skin of a cow. It's going to soak into your skin as well. You know, when I, when I was uh, in college, and we won't say what year that was, it's been a while now, but we used an old product called Warbex. And I don't know if you guys remember Warbex or not, but it was basically in a, in a tin container and you poured it into another tin container and used a, a tin ladle to apply it to the back of the yeah. animal. And if you got that on yourself, it was almost like toxic waste. It would burn it to the point you had to go wash it off right then. Mm. But uh, I guarantee those cattle didn't have grubs. <laughs> Guaranteed clean. <laughs> they might have not had a calf for two years, but they didn't have grubs. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> oh, goodness. Brandy, is Brandy still with us? Does she have any other questions or thoughts? Well... Yeah, I think we covered about it. Is there any other products that y'all carry? Uh, for I mean, it can be, you know, we talked about fly control. We talked about, you know, lice control. Um, you know, what else do y'all promote that uh, would kind of fall under this category here? You know, just in general, I guess there's, there's, um, in, in talking about any of the company's products, whether it's ours or, or somebody else's, it's always good to stay with a branded product um, because a, a lot of reasons, but we also test every one of those products when they come off the line. So if you're dealing with the Elanco now owns Bayer, with any of the Bayer products or any of the Merck products, all of them are tested for quality control and they have to guarantee that what they say is in the product is in there. If you're dealing with some of the generics, they are cheaper, but they're also not tested oftentimes. And so you kind of get what you pay for often. Yeah. Um, and so I, I would say stick with a branded product regardless of what company you're going with and the results are going to be a lot better um, and the products are going to work for you. And also keep in mind, there's expiration dates on these products. There's labels to be how to be used. Uh, you can use them the way the product instructions say. If you use them in a different way, that's actually illegal unless you have a veterinarian's, uh, you know, direction. And then that's extra label use and not off label use. And I would also say keep in, keep in mind those withdrawal times, especially if you're sending some cattle to the market. Uh, so keep in, keep in mind when you treat an animal, how long it's going to stay on your place as well. So, yeah. but uh, I think we covered uh, pretty much everything we were hoping to cover today and uh i really appreciate you joining in on the mountaineer farm talk the voice of west virginia agriculture i have to get that in there so <laughs> but anyway but thank you so much and i appreciate both of you guys for joining in and brandy she's already uh tagged off and i know those two agents were at camp and i know that always makes everything a little harder when you do it from camp so thank y'all both for coming thank you jake uh for coming as well well, thank you guys. If you ever want to talk about vaccines or deworming or anything like that, I'd love to love to have another discussion with you. Definitely. We'll probably have you on for another segment there. Uh, just talking about probably vaccines or wormers or whatever. We, we love to talk cattle on, on, on here. We started out kind of more cattle based and just kind of broadened it to the Mountaineer Farm Talk. But, uh, but thank you everybody for joining. Mm -hmm.